Well, this evening we are returning to uh, Matthew chapter 5, so uh, what I'd like to do is read beginning in verse 27. I'll read the text we looked at this morning, and we'll flow into the, the last two verses of this passage, which we didn't look at this morning. And it is a rather large subject, so I, I want to get right to it. Jesus says, beginning in verse 27, You have heard that it was said, You shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your right hand makes you stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. It was said, whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except for the reason of unchastity, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Well, again, may the Lord bless his word to our uh, hearing this evening. Now, this morning we were looking at what our Lord Jesus Christ had to say about the seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery. And he was distinguishing what God really intended as over against the rabbinic tradition. Remember, in their view, the command simply prohibited the act. Jesus tells us we can also break it in our hearts if we have a strong desire to engage in sexual activity with someone we're not married to. Uh, if we're married uh, or that person, the other person is married, we, can't, we have committed adultery in our hearts. But if neither we nor the other person is married, we have still sinned. We have committed the sin of fornication. So the commandment, remember, uh, forbids, prohibits all sexual sin. Now, Jesus isn't saying, again, as I mentioned before, that breaking this sin in our hearts is the same as breaking it in our action. There is a big difference, as we noted, with regard to the sixth and the seventh commandment, between wanting to kill someone and actually killing them, and between wanting to have sexual relations and actually having them. We don't find anywhere in Scripture anyone being executed for hating or for lusting, but we do see them executed or capital punishment being enacted for both murder and adultery. So there is, there is a difference, although Jesus is telling us, as we saw before, that it is still a very serious sin. It is a violation of his commands, serious enough, he says, to bring eternal condemnation, and really every sin does, okay? And that is what we would have received for it, and really, what all of our sins deserve apart from the grace of the Lord. But being in Christ by faith, we're also reminded no sin will ever destroy us. And I just want to keep repeating that because we never want to excuse our sins on the basis of God's grace. But we want his grace rather to be a reason or a motivation to fight against every sin. And Jesus tells us that that's exactly what his grace will produce in us, a fighting against every sin, which is what he meant by these last couple of verses we read for our text this morning. By his spirit, we will tear out the offending eye and cut off the offending hand. We'll work to kill these sins in our hearts so that not only we'll not only keep ourselves from actually doing those things, but also strengthening ourselves from wanting to do them, putting the sins to death in our hearts. Now this evening, I want us to move on to the second part of the text. The rabbinic tradition had also corrupted God's original intent for marriage. At least one school among the Jews taught that if a man, uh, that a man might divorce his wife uh, for any reason at all. Jesus tells us here that to do so for any reason but one is to commit adultery. So that's what we want to look at this evening. Now, first again, uh, first we're reminded again that Jesus here is not addressing God's law, but he is addressing the rabbinic interpretation of the law, even though he is quoting 
scripture. And again, we understand that because of the way it's stated. We read in verse 31, it was said, whoever divorces or whoever sends his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Now again, notice he doesn't say it is written, which would be his usual formula for introducing scripture, but rather it is set. Now in this quote, he is actually quoting the law that he gave through Moses. But again, remember the rabbinic interpretation. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to read what the law of God actually says in this particular area because we're going to have to make reference to it a couple of times at least in the sermon. So Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses one through four, and there we read this. And this is what Jesus is referring to. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house. And she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife. And if the latter husband turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away is not allowed to take her again to be his wife since she has been defiled. For that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. Now again, let me remind you that though this is what he is quoting, this is not what he is addressing, not the commandment itself. I mean, he is, but he isn't. He's, he's going to deal with the Jewish misinterpretation of this particular law and in the process tell us what it really means. Now let me just mention as I read this, uh, it's been said that Moses gave this law by way of permission. This was not a commandment, this was something that was given to them because of the hardness of their hearts and so forth and there's a line of reasoning that goes down this direction but there's another passage in scripture where Moses, or excuse me, Jesus refers to this as a commandment given by Moses. So whether it's permission or a commandment, I think we need to understand it is inspired by the Lord. It's a part of his word. It was something that he allowed. But the hardness of heart is something we will come back to, uh, to look at. Now with regard to this passage, there were two main schools of thought uh, that were prevalent in the Jewish community I think you've heard this before. There was the school of Hillel, who understood the words some indecency, which are the grounds upon which a man would send his wife away, to mean anything in the wife that was offensive or disagreeable to the husband. If he didn't like her cooking, she burned the food, literally. The rabbinic tradition said, if she burned the food, put too much salt in the food, the husband didn't like the meals she was preparing, or if he found a woman that he thought was prettier than his wife, then he could divorce her. All he had to do was put a certificate of divorce in her hands that basically says, I divorce you, and send her away with no alimony, no child support, nothing but a document to prove that she was legally divorced so that she could remarry. Now the other school of thought, the other school that was basically competing with them is, was the school of Shammai, who taught that this indecency could only mean adultery, some sexual uncleanness. Now which of the two schools do you think was on the ascendancy in, in the culture in those days? Well, it's the same one that's in our day. You know, they, they take the, the more lax interpretation, the one that's more liberal, the one that allows you to do what it is you want to do. This is what Jesus is correcting, is the view of Hillel, the more liberal and broad interpretation. Now, what is it that Jesus tells us that God really intended by this statement? He goes on in verse 32 to tell us, but I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife except for the reason of unchastity makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. 
Jesus here is clearly siding with the second school, that of Shammai. The proper grounds for divorce is indecency or unchastity, a word that means sexual uncleanness, which lexicographers, basically those that put together the Greek lexicons who study the the word in all of its different contexts, believe means generally adultery in the context of marriage, but could also mean other forms of unlawful sexual activity. If a woman was found to be an unrepentant adulteress, then her husband may divorce her. And I I wanted to include that word unrepentant because I believe that this is what Jesus is addressing when he says, Moses gave you this command because of the hardness of your hearts. You're unwilling to show mercy. You're unwilling to forgive if your spouse was repentant. If our spouse should break the marriage covenant and then repent and ask forgiveness, even though they've broken the covenant, I believe our Lord would have us show mercy, renew that covenant with them. But of course, if they continue to break it, there comes a point when the right thing to do is to put them away. And I believe that that's what this commandment was really all about, what Jesus actually is telling us. This is what it's about. Now, it is true that adultery often carried with it the death penalty, but I think we have to recognize that there were times when the the, the capital punishment was not carried out. The husband could forgive, but he could also divorce. And if he divorced on those grounds, the woman could marry again. And she and her husband, her new husband, would not be guilty of adultery, nor would the man who put his wife away on those grounds as he remarries someone else. Otherwise, I don't think the Lord would have allowed that even in the old covenant. But now here is the key that we need to see. She wouldn't be guilty and he wouldn't be guilty because she was lawfully released from her previous marriage. The the covenant was broken. It no longer existed. Divorce could be sought as long as there is an existing covenant. If you're bound to somebody, then you have to remain true to that person. But if if the covenant is broken, then another marriage can be contracted without adultery. But now if adultery wasn't the grounds, then as Jesus explains, the husband who divorces his wife causes her to commit adultery when she remarries. I think remarriage is is obviously in view here. Again, I, I was mentioning a little bit earlier today as I was talking about this, that there, is, there was somebody who I had met before who believed that simply the act of divorcing the wife would, would cause her to be an adulteress, but if she doesn't remarry, that, that wouldn't be the case. The fact is, in those days, a woman, in order to have support, would have to remarry. And so if the husband put his wife away for less than biblical grounds, and she would then, of course, remarry, he becomes the cause of her committing adultery because he sent her away, because he's the one who prosecuted the divorce on less than biblical grounds. Now, the one who married her would also be committing adultery. And the reason is because she would still be bound by her first marriage covenant. She's still married to her first husband. The divorce did not make any difference with regard to the marriage covenant itself. It's the act of adultery. That, that breaks it, you see, that breaks, that violates the covenant, the, the, you know, the, the covenant of companionship, the, the, the one flesh covenant. Now, this also means that, again, if her first husband remarried under these circumstances, he would also commit adultery. So Jesus is telling us here that the seventh commandment can be broken, not only by engaging in activity with someone who is married, and not only in our hearts by lusting after another to whom we're not married, it can also be broken by remarrying if our previous marriage covenant has not been broken by, in this case, adultery. The exception Jesus gives us to this rule of divorce and remarriage is when that covenant has been broken by adultery. If that's the case, and again, unrepentant adultery If that is the case, the divorce is legitimate 
there is no binding marriage covenant and so no adultery upon remarriage. Now, the Bible does give us one for other ground of divorce and remarriage that doesn't violate the seventh commandment. It's actually given to us by Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, and that is desertion by an unbeliever. Now, I want to read that passage. He begins in 1 Corinthians 7, verses 10 and 11, by going over the same ground that Jesus goes over in Matthew 5, and he repeats it in, in Matthew 19. He says this, But to the married I give instructions, not I, but the Lord, that the wife should not leave her husband, but if she does leave, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband and that the husband should not divorce his wife. Now again, he reminds us of what it is that Jesus reminds us of in Matthew chapter 5, that it is God's will that marriage lasts for a lifetime. The wife should not divorce her husband. I mean, that, that is a command. Don't do it nor the husband his wife. Now, it's generally assumed that Paul is speaking here about two believers because of what he is going to next address with regard to a believer being married to an unbeliever. And because Paul says this is also what the Lord said and what we're, we're looking at in our text, what the Lord actually was talking about. But he also adds that if the wife leaves, and the same thing would apply to the husband, that she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. Now the question might come up, why can't she simply marry someone else if she is no longer married to her husband? Well, the fact is, because there's no adultery in view here, uh, she is still bound to her husband, even though she is divorced. Her marriage covenant wasn't broken. To marry somebody else in this situation would be to commit adultery, which is why Paul goes on to say she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, okay? Because essentially, she, he is still her husband. Now, Paul almost seems to be giving her a choice here, whether to remain unmarried or else to be reconciled, but there really isn't any question, I think, in Scripture, especially from the fact that Paul says she shouldn't leave, but if she does, this is what she needs to do, and from the fact that our Lord requires reconciliation. Remember what we saw with regard to the command that had to do with being angry with a, with a brother in your heart and how that breaks the, the sixth commandment. It goes on to say that if you are coming to worship God, and there you remember that your brother has something against you, well, go and be reconciled first to your brother, and then come and worship the Lord. Now, if that applies to an offense between you and a brother, and that needs to be dealt with before you can come and worship, what about those who are married and yet are not reconciled? The Lord desires reconciliation. Paul is saying here, the, the wife should not have left her husband in the first place unless she had biblical grounds, such as her husband committing unrepentant adultery. But in this case, she must not have these grounds. Otherwise, Paul would have not required her to remain in this condition or in this state, which means that there's still a covenant that exists between them. Although, we have to also bear in mind what Paul says next, that if she remains unmarried and unreconciled, then she's essentially abandoning the marriage covenant. And that which case there would be a breaking of the covenant because again, that is the second grounds. So she is to remain single in the sense that she isn't to marry somebody else so that she and her husband can both reconcile because there is still the matter of their marriage bond not being broken. There is a covenant between them that still exists. So then Paul goes on to address a second ground for divorce, and that is desertion in verses 12 through 16. As I told you, we have a lot of ground to cover, so I'm just going to keep moving ahead. He says this, but to the rest I say not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever, and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband, and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. 
For the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband. For otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. But yet, if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. For how do you know, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? Now, I do want you to notice first that even though the Lord forbids us to marry an unbeliever, as Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14, do not be bound together with unbelievers. For what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? Paul is saying that if we should do this, or if we should be converted while married to an unbeliever, let's say two unbelievers got married and one of them got converted, he says, stay in the marriage relationship if that is what your unbelieving spouse is willing to do. But he goes on to say, if they should leave, if they should desert the marriage covenant, Paul says, let them leave. Actually, it's even stronger in the original. He says, they must leave. You are not to do anything to stop them or to prevent it. But the question arises, if the unbeliever departs, are they still married? Is there still a marriage covenant that exists? Well, notice again what Paul says in verses 15 and 16. The brother or the sister is not under bondage, is not bound in such cases. They're loosed, in other words. He goes on to say later in this chapter, are you loosed from a wife? Don't seek a wife. You may, but don't do it because of the times. See, the point is you're no longer bound to the marriage covenant, but God has called us to peace. So here is the second grounds that breaks the marriage covenant, and that is desertion. The marriage covenant has been broken, which means the believer and the unbeliever are both free to remarry without violating the seventh commandment. So basically, there's two grounds for a divorce where remarrying is not adultery. When a spouse commits unrepentant adultery, and when an unbelieving spouse deserts the marriage. Now, a question might come up. What if both are believers and one of them abandons the marriage? Well, we, you know, Paul does address that partially. But I think the situation is really no different than that of the believer married to the unbeliever. If the un, I should say, if, if a believer departs from a marriage and all attempts to bring them back fails then the next thing that you would do would be to enact church discipline. You'd bring it to the church, and if they don't repent, they're put out of the fellowship. If that happens, the Lord says we should treat them as an unbeliever. And if they are treated as such, then, as Paul says, if the unbeliever departs, he must depart. In other words, you'd have the same situation Paul is referring to with the believer and the unbeliever. Now, another thing to consider is whether the guilty party... The one who deserts or the adulterer is ever able to remarry or whether somebody can marry them without committing adultery. Now, this is the area where I think a lot of commentators really don't know how to answer the question because the Bible never actually talks about what happens to the guilty party or the one who abandons. But it's actually easy to figure out if it is in fact true that the reason that anyone commits adultery is because they are already in an existing marriage covenant. When they remarry, uh, then if they're free from the marriage covenant that they were in before, which they would be, if the innocent party is free from that marriage covenant, it also implies that the one who was guilty is also free. He's the one that broke it, that caused the sin, that, that brought about the you know, the, the freeing from the, the covenant. But it frees both of them, not just one of them, which means they can remarry without committing adultery. The, the question has, has, been, has been said, or actually I've heard it put before, that if, um, 
somebody were to divorce his spouse and that spouse remarried, that person could never remarry because they're still bound to this person, but this person is bound to this other person. And yet we're going to see in a moment, the Lord says you can really never divorce the other one and come back to the previous spouse. We've actually already read that in Deuteronomy 24. But the point is this, if, if Jesus is correct, which we know he is in Matthew chapter 5, and he says that the person who uh, basically is guilty of, of the sin of adultery can be divorced and this person can remarry without adultery. That means that the person who was divorced is no longer bound to that person. And that person can be restored and that person can remarry and it will not constitute adultery. Now here's another related question. What if somebody again sinfully divorces their spouse, marries another person, and in so doing commits adultery, but then later comes to their senses and repents. Do they need to divorce their current spouse and try to get back with their former spouse? There are a number of people who would say yes to that question, that that's the only way you can genuinely repent if it's still possible to get back to your original spouse. But the answer is clearly no, because to do this would be again to commit adultery, because now you're married to somebody else, and even though they committed adultery by so doing, they do not live in perpetual adultery. The adultery is really committed but one time. If they divorced without biblical grounds and married somebody else and by so doing committed adultery, that adultery broke the first marriage covenant and it makes the second marriage covenant valid because you're no longer bound to the first marriage. And if that's not enough, we also have the express statement of our Lord through Moses in the passage that we read in Deuteronomy. And let me read that again, Deuteronomy 24, verses 3 and 4. Okay, this is already, the first husband has already sent his wife out with a certificate of divorce and she's remarried. If the latter husband turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away, is not allowed to take her again to be his wife since she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord. And you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. Now the Lord tells us here, he doesn't say they should divorce and go back. He says that they must not go back. They are to remain in the, their current marriage or to contract a marriage with somebody else but not with the original spouse. Now one last thing to consider is that even though those who divorce without biblical grounds and remarry aren't continuing to commit adultery in the marriage covenant that they are in, that doesn't mean they're not adulterers because you only have to commit adultery once to become an adulterer in the same way that a murderer, if he murders one person, is still a murderer even though he doesn't continue to murder other people. Now the good news though is this, they don't have to remain adulterers, they don't have to remain murderers. None of us have to remain guilty of any of the sins that we have committed. After Paul gives us a list of just a few of the many sins that would make us guilty and shut us out of the kingdom of heaven, he tells us that when we trust in the Lord Jesus, those things are no longer true of us. Listen to what he writes in 1 Corinthians 6, verses 9 through 11. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. But then he goes on to say, such were some of you. Notice the past tense. But you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of Jesus Christ and in the spirit of our God. So this reminds us again of what we saw this morning uh, in the Westminster Confession of Faith. Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 15, section 4 says this, uh, 
As there is no sin so small, but it deserves damnation, so there is no sin so great that it can bring damnation upon those who truly repent. And the point here is that with adultery like any other sin, if you have committed that sin by, well, in this case, uh, divorcing and remarrying without biblical grounds, if you've done this sometime in your past, but you've repented and you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to know that the Lord has forgiven you. He's forgiven you of that sin as well as all other sins if you have turned from those sins and turned to him in faith. Our sins will only cling to us until we actually run to the Lord Jesus. But if we do, he will wash them all away so that you're no longer an adulterer, you're no longer a murderer, you're no longer any of those things that you were before. So I just want to encourage you that if you haven't come to him, that you come to him now and find that forgiveness for all your sins, as well as the perfect righteousness you need to enter into heaven. I mean, this is the gospel. If we didn't have this, uh, this blessed gift from the Lord, if we didn't have this message, if Jesus had not done what he had done, all of us would still be guilty of all of our sins and we would perish forever. But Jesus came and he lived and he died and he rose again so that all who trust him might be washed and might eventually enter into heaven purely by his grace. So if you haven't come to Jesus, I would encourage you to come. He will forgive you. He will receive you. You never have to be afraid that he will turn you away. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And, and let's thank the Lord for his mercies toward us. And let's pray that he will help us again to be faithful to him uh, in the area of our marriages or if we haven't yet married, that as we look forward to it, we will purpose to do that when the Lord brings that right person along.